Welcome everyone. My name is Nicole Naditz. I taught French for 25 years, uh, mostly high school in Northern California, and I was the 2015 Actful National Language Teacher of the Year. But today I'm really excited to be here as your host in the first of a series of interviews centered on the high leverage teaching practices. So over the course of this program, we will be examining how we can use high leverage teaching practices in our work as language educators. High leverage teaching practices are those that are essential to successful world language instruction that meets the needs of all learners. As we will come to see over the course of this program, they are not best practices, but rather practices that can and should be taught in teacher preparation programs so that teachers are empowered to implement them from their first day of instruction. Our guide on this journey will be the book, Enacting the Work of World Language Instruction, High Leverage Teaching Practices by Drs. Eileen Glisson and Richard Donato. And our first interview today will be with these accomplished researchers and educators. Subsequent programs will help us break down each of the high leverage teaching practices in a series of interviews with national leaders in world language education as they share how they bring these practices to life in their courses. So without further ado, let's meet today's guests. Our first guest is Dr. Richard Donato, who is a professor and chair of the Department of Instruction and Learning at the University of Pittsburgh and holds joint appointments in the departments of French and Italian, Hispanic Languages and Literatures, and Linguistics. His research interests include early foreign language learning, sociocultural theory, classroom discourse analysis, and teacher education. He has earned several awards for his research on foreign language education, including the American Council on the Teaching of Foreign Languages, Modern Language Journal, Paul Pimsleur Award in 1997 and 2006, and the University of Pittsburgh's Provost Award for Doctoral Student Research Mentoring in 2016. He is the co-author of A Tale of Two Schools, Developing Sustainable Early Language Programs, published in 2010, and Enacting the Work of Language Teaching, High Leverage Teaching Practices in 2017. Joining him today is Dr. Eileen Glisson, who is a distinguished university professor of Spanish at Indiana University of Pennsylvania, where she coordinates the Spanish Education K-12 program. She was president of ACTFL in 2010 and is certified by ACTFL as an oral proficiency tester of Spanish. She is the co-author co of Teacher's Handbook, Contextualized Language Instruction, now in its fifth edition. She is also the co-author of Enacting the work of world language, sorry, enacting the work of language instruction, high leverage teaching practice, and implementing integrated performance assessment. She has published numerous articles and edited books in scholarly journals, such as the Modern Language Journal, the Foreign Language Annals, the Canadian Modern Language Review. Dr. Glisson is the recipient of several awards, including the 2012 PSMLA Frank Mulhern Leadership Award for Outstanding Leadership in World Languages and Cultures, the 1996 Anthony Papalia Award for Excellence in Teacher Education. So it is my pleasure to have both Rick and Eileen here with us today, and we're going to start off with Rick. Sure. So Rick, what compelled you to write this book together? Well, I think both for Eileen and, and myself, I think some of it was our own experiences in teacher education that we were not fully satisfied with how teachers were being trained, that there was sort of a weak return for our investment in teacher preparation, um, and that there were fundamental skills that all teachers, both novices and experiences, needed to know, and that very often teacher education programs tried to do too much with novice teachers. In other words, what they were learning were not exactly developmentally appropriate for developing an accomplished novice teacher. So we had a lot of attention was on the knowledge base, which is certainly important, but the teaching skill itself was reduced to, you know, writing reflections or observation reports. And students were being trained in university classrooms, then launched into schools, and the connection was often weak. Mm -hmm. So then we came upon this HLTP movement, the work of Deborah Ball, uh, Grossman, Forzani, Kennedy, and this all sort of made sense to us. And we were, were struck by a return to sort of practice-based teaching education, sort of like what happened in the normal schools, where emphasis was placed on the actual act of teaching, being coached, and we'll have more on that later, rather than just basically discussing teaching. Um, so, you know, we found it compelling that this HLT movement made the claim that teaching was complex work, unnatural work, and not easily learned from just observation alone. Um, 
And so um, we, I began look, we began looking at this and found out, well, a lot of this work was being done in reading, in math, in English language arts, but foreign language education was not part of this. And so Eileen and I then decided to kind of look into this and to see, you know, how might we enter the conversation of high level teacher practices um, and, and how can we do this within the context of foreign language education? Oh, that's really interesting. And it actually segues nicely into the next question because Eileen, in the book, you and Rick make the point that these high leverage teaching practices aren't best practices. So what are the high leverage teaching practices that you both were looking at as you researched this book and got ready to bring it into world language education? And how are they different from best practices? Okay, would you like me to go through the high leverage practices? I'm going if to do can... that. I think I'm going to do that, but if you want to do that, you can. But... <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, let me go ahead and do that. I, I kind of planned that out, so let, let me go ahead and talk about that. But basically, um, to answer the question about the differences, you know, um, we have a lot of best practices out in the field that we've heard about, and these are often slogans um, that, uh, that give us um, good ideas for what we should be doing in the classroom, but um, the slogans do not go beyond that. For example, we use authentic materials. We know that these are good, this is a good idea, this is a wonderful practice to have, but best practices do not explain how to go about doing that particular practice or why it's, it's necessary in the classroom. High leverage practices are those that can be deconstructed. They can be they can be um, kind of taken apart into the various uh, teaching moves for um, novices and of course more experienced teachers as well um, to practice them. So as we um, began thinking about high leverage practices, of course, we kind of have to go back to the research priorities and education uh, project. Um, Rick and I, co-directed that project for a number of years. And uh, back in 2012, we actually published a special issue in Foreign Language Annals in which we brought the research priorities authors uh, in to do projects in K-16 classrooms. And one of those um, articles dealt with high leverage practices. It was actually kind of the first time that they were presented um, to the field Laws and Laws uh, authored uh, that particular article. And that began the dialogue about these practices. And then Actful had a, a number of different meetings where we talked about them and, um, and identified them. And then Rick and I sort of took that discussion and um, identified the six practices that we present um, in the book. So the first uh, practice that we talked about is, is facilitating target language comprehensibility. Uh, which focuses on strategies that teachers can use to make their target language input understandable to learners. And we accomplished this particular practice by using a tool that we've called the Interaction and Target Language Comprehensibility Tool. Um, and it's divided into three parts, creating comprehensible language, creating meaningful context for comprehension, and engaging learners in comprehensible um, interactions. And you know, as an aside, Nicole, often when, when you ask teachers how they make their input comprehensible, they usually say through gestures and visuals. And certainly while those strategies can be helpful, teachers often um, lack um, the ability to see other ways in which they can make their actually their language um, comprehensible through strategies such as paraphrasing new words, I, defining words with examples rather than through translation, and signaling. Mm -hmm words with tone of voice, just to name a few. Um, the second uh, practice is building a, a classroom discourse community. And of course, that uh, follows logically from making your target language comprehensible. And this larger practice, or what we call large grain practice, is divided into two smaller uh, practices. One is engaging learners in oral classroom communication. And this focuses on developing discourse practices that will encourage learners to communicate within meaningful context. So we talk about strategies such as establishing meaningful context for interaction, even incorporating humor and what we call chit chat in the classroom. Um, the second practice is designing oral interpersonal group and pair tasks. 
And this is really important in the classroom because so many times textbooks present tasks that they label interpersonal, but they're really presentational because student A knows what student B is going to say and vice versa. So we really deconstruct for teachers uh, how to go about designing activities that are truly interpersonal, where there really is an information gap and where students have to negotiate meaning with one another. Um, the third practice that we present is, is guiding learners to interpret and discuss authentic texts. And that's divided into um, also two smaller brain practices. One is guiding learners to interpret authentic texts and then leading a text-based discussion. It's really interesting too, Nicole, that leading a text-based discussion seems to be a universal practice that most disciplines, even including mathematics, have identified as being high leverage. Um, the fourth practice is focusing on form in a dialogic context through pace. And we distinguish in this practice between lessons that are just designed to teach the grammar point of the day from lessons that actually draw attention to form in meaningful contexts um, and using cultural texts. The fifth practice is focusing on cultural products, practices, and perspectives in a dialogic context through a model that we call the image model. Um, the acronym image represents four steps of the model, images, seeing images, making observations about them, analyzing additional information regarding these images, uh, generating hypotheses about cultural perspectives that could be um, demonstrated through the, the images, and then exploring perspectives and reflecting further. Um, so these lessons are developed around a series of cultural images that, that lead students to make cultural observations and draw conclusions. And the final practice is providing oral corrective feedback to improve learner performance. It's critical to note that this term corrective feedback goes beyond the traditional notion of correcting grammatical errors in as much as it really is a tool for mediating language learning and development. So the practice is enacted by means of a tool um, that we present and it guides teachers in a step-by-step -step fashion to make in the moment decisions more or less about whether to provide corrective feedback or not, and what type of corrective feedback might best give, um, might, might best fit the circumstance given contextual and learner factors. Thank you. Rick, would you like to jump on any of those to? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, yeah, I think Eileen did a good job of listing what the six practices were in this book and uh, briefly summarize them. I guess one thing that I would say, if we take a look at that last one that Eileen was talking about, providing oral corrective feedback, and, and I agree with, uh, with Eileen that we have to really watch this word corrective. Um, I, I think something that's interesting and why I think this is a high leverage practice is that in our work with teachers, in particular some of Eileen's work with teachers, it's become obvious to us that teachers have never really thought about how they provide feedback to students, why they provide feedback to students, what their goals are, um, and that, they've, uh, that, they, uh, that the default position for feedback to students is often error correction to get the students to produce a grammatically correct sentence. And that's not the only reason why we give feedback. Um, and so I think within this particular practice, we deconstruct this in ways that help teachers understand that prompting correction on the part of the student can be done implicitly with repetition and clarification requests, or explicitly with elicitation, cueing, or metalinguistic cues, or reformulating what students say with implicit recast or explicit correction. And this tool that Eileen um, talked about helps teachers sort of think through this process of feedback. Uh, to understand the process better in the context of whatever classroom task they're trying to conduct. So it's that kind of deconstruction of these practices, this detailing of the practices, which, which we do in for each one of these. And as Eileen said, often best practices tell us what to do, they don't tell us how to do it. And I think that's part of the appeal of this book is that it's giving teachers, without being highly prescriptive, giving teachers an understanding of what the complex pedagogical moves are in doing some of these, these best practices that are out there in the field. Does that answer your question? 
Oh, absolutely. And I think one of the things that uh, that really impacted me as I read the book was the inten intentionality with which both of you explored and deconstructed each of the practices so that teachers can begin to understand why each practice is important and what it looks like to enact that practice in the classroom. And in fact, on page 10 of the book, I was particularly struck by what it says there regarding these skills being those that are, quote, learnable in initial teacher preparation programs and developmentally appropriate for novice teachers. So Eileen, I was wondering if you could share a quick example from the classroom or the preparation program that highlights these characteristics of the high leverage teaching practices. Well, the very first practice that I mentioned in terms of making one's input comprehensible, um, I think is a perfect example of this. Uh, in as much as novices in methodology classes can practice these various ways to make language uh, more comprehensible to learners um, through examples such as giving synonyms, rephrasing, slowing down one's speech, um, uh, in not only language, but also um, using visuals and using gestures and practicing um, setting up contexts where students can interact with one another because we know that language is also comprehensible by having students use it because that's the way that we know whether they're really understanding it or not. And so in a methodology class and what Rick and I have found in workshops that we do with teachers, it's, it's really quite uh, eye-opening that even though we do a lot of talking about this particular practice, when we actually um, ask teachers, how do you make your, your, in, your input comprehensible? Um, it, it's a bit of a stretch for them to try to explain that. And so we can engage uh, novices in um, presenting a, a, a new vocabulary word, for example, and uh, trying to come up with ways to make it comprehensive, com more comprehensible by defining it, by defining it with examples, uh, and these are the kinds of, of hands-on tasks that work really, really well in a methods class and that we use, quite frankly, in workshops with teachers, both novice teachers and teachers who've been out in the field for quite a while. Um, so all of these are, are uh, very doable in a methods class and doable in field experiences and student teaching alike. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, one of the things for any one of our listeners who hasn't yet finished reading the book, um, each of the high leverage teaching practices actually includes specific activities for those reading the book or those teachers that they're working with. They can work together on them. They could use it as a, as a professional learning opportunity, even if they're practicing teachers in the field already, um, to really begin understanding what it would look like to enact each of these practices. So, sorry, okay. <laughs> no, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, and in fact, I want to turn to another one now because, Rick, for those who wish to begin enacting the high leverage teaching practices, you recommend a cyclical model that has six iterative phases. So I was hoping you could briefly describe the phases yeah, through sure. which teachers should progress. Yeah, and to keep in mind that this is both for teacher education, it could also be used, these phases, for professional development in service days with teachers, ways of working with these HLTPs. Um, the six phases um, is that you begin with some observation and analysis of the HLTP. So this is your, your basic sort of demonstration of what it is. Um, from then, you move into deconstructing the practice as part of the analysis, breaking it into steps, what are the component parts, the intentionality, as you say. I think that's very important, is this notion that, yes, these are intentional and are decision points that teachers make depending on you know, what they're trying to do. Um, at that point, then there's sort of a planning to enact the particular HLTP with the help of the tools that we provide. Um, this is often done in groups or pairs, so the lesson to be taught is collaboratively constructed and not the unique property of one individual. So this is sort of like the lesson study model. So some group account there's group accountability here. No one feels personally responsible for success or failure when actually um, this, the, the HLTP is taken into the classroom. 
From then, an important component of HLTP is this notion of rehearsal and coaching. Um, when you deconstruct a practice, the term that's used in the HLTP literature is approximations of practice, which is, so Eileen deconstructed uh, the comprehensible input to show that each one of those features are really important to be rehearsed. Uh, it's, it, it, there, you can say it, but you actually have to learn how to slow down your syntax, simplify, uh, emphasize with voice. So master's teachers may um, stop a lesson as, um, you know, as a, a student teacher is teaching and is rehearsing or as a colleague is doing that, ask for some reteaching of a segment after feedback, discuss to consider the effectiveness of a particular instruction to remove. Um, and, and this is this notion of coaching that goes on, this instructional coaching. Um, students themselves, uh, students orient themselves to demonstration lessons with peers, often we find as performances to be observed and then and often plotted. Um, this, uh, they often view coaching, as Eileen said, interruption. So this is a real uh, important point in the model, that students need to be prepared for coaching. I'll just give you a little anecdote. So last year, uh, last semester, I was coaching my students and a comment that one student made was, well, you know, Dr. Donato interrupts us and then we forget what we're doing. Well, that's the point, that they should be forgetting what they're doing and they should be doing something else. So you really need to prepare, you really need to prepare students for this notion of coaching uh, during the um, rehearsal stage. Then the next, the fifth uh, part of the cycle is the enactment of practice in, in six, in pre-K 16 classrooms, how the practice might have been, have addressed an instructional challenge the teacher may have faced. Um, often these are videotaped, then brought back to the class and viewed, and then there's an assessment of that practice by collaborative partners. So that could be the teacher, the classmates, other teachers, supervisors, cooperating teachers. In our own program, we actually bring in the supervisors during that time to watch the enactment of that process with real students in real classrooms. The cycle is iterative in the sense that, let's say during rehearsal, it's observed that there are still problems with enacting the practice, such as not asking the right questions at the right time during the task-based discussion, or presenting in a teacher-fronted way rather than engaging in a dialogic interaction with the class. At that point, the teacher educator or professional development leader could circle back to deconstruction or to the planning process, whatever was needed at the time to focus on the practice. Or another example, if the practice does not go well in a real classroom, maybe the students are not speaking in a comprehensible way, students are not connected to listening to and making sense of the language they hear. The class could analyze the problem, revise the plan, reteach the lesson at a later time. So the cyclical model is flexible and responsive to how well teachers are carrying out the practice and if the practice is actually what students need at the time. So this cycle of observe, deconstruct, analyze, enact, actually concerns a degree of teacher decision-making in reference to these practices. So we don't wanna leave the listener with the idea that these are prescriptions that are to be followed in some lockstep fashion. Rather, we argue as Kennedy does in her 215 article, in the practice of teaching. In teacher education, we need to spend less attention on exclusively focusing on bodies of professional knowledge, less attention to ensuring that teachers carry out the specific teaching behaviors and moves in some lockstep fashion. And we need to spend far more attention to the persistent challenges that compri comprise teaching and how our knowledge and the recommended HLTPs or core practices can address those problems. So I think this iterative cycle tries to help novices and experienced teachers understand how both knowledge and practices and procedures are relevant to the kinds of problems they face in classrooms and how to think more analytically, not just reflectively, um, in some unanchored reflection, but analysis about these practices and how they're being carried out. But of course, this means that teachers need to understand the practices first to allow them to use them flexibly to address the instructional challenges they face. So we actually conclude each chapter with a section on how practices address larger educational goals. Thank you. 
And actually, I want to hone in on one of the things that you spoke about and kind of move this a little bit into looking at how we work with the high leverage teaching practices in the classrooms of practicing educators. So these are educators who've already left their teacher preparation programs and right. they're now teaching in the classrooms. And in the book, you both note that in many fields, such as music and sports, coaching is a critical component of the practitioner's success. And you talked about that a little bit, Rick. And yet teaching is often described as occurring in a silo. And the true coaching, and I think of the kind that you were starting to, to talk about, Rick, uh, including a critical examination of practice is rarely seen. So I was wondering, Eileen, if you might be able to share what you think coaching might look like if we, you know, ignore maybe what's, what is happening in many classrooms and schools and settings around the country, but what you would like to see happen in terms of coaching in order to support teachers to fully integrate these into their practice. Well, certainly if you're talking about, you're really talking about in-service teachers, right? Is that the question? Yes. Teachers who are already, they finished their, their credential programs or preparation programs. Yeah. Right. They're already, they're already certified now teaching. Well, I think that we really have to have to move our understanding of how teacher development takes place. And certainly as you heard Rick describe, what we're suggesting and what other fields have embraced is, is much, much different from the traditional model of teacher preparation, where you, you, have, you have a prospective teacher observe something, or even an in-service teacher in a workshop. They observe something, they try to do it, they usually can't do it very well, um, they reflect on it, and the discussion is usually much, much delayed from the actual occurrence of the teaching event. So there isn't much progress made, because if you're not talking about what you just did until two weeks down the road, uh, you've really missed the teachable moment. So I think that in terms of, of in-service teachers, what needs to happen is there, there needs to be some time built in for mentors, for mentor teachers to coach novice teachers who are in the district, um, observe them, uh, do coaching, in the moment coaching. You know, in a language classroom, for example, um, if teachers are speaking in the foreign language, they, they can coach one another without students thinking that there is, is a problem or somebody isn't doing something correctly. And I, I've been trying this in my own program with um, our cooperating teacher mentors in student teaching where they're speaking in Spanish and the co-op will interrupt at times when the lesson is just taking a turn and needs to just stop and, 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 and take a different turn for the best. And the co-op will speak in, in Spanish to the student teacher and the student teacher will immediately know what to do. And the other students see this as being a normal part of collaboration among teachers in a classroom. And so I think that we need to get to that point where teachers can work together, where teachers are freed up and have time during the day, because I realize that's another problem, um, to observe one another and mentor one another um, in terms of, of high leverage practices. Yeah, I can, can I just piggyback on that? Because I think this Absolutely. is really important. Some of the research that we did when we started instituting high leverage practice um, curriculum in our MAT program was that students were very resistant to coaching. Um, and I think, you know, some teachers are too. Teaching is a very personal experience, right? No one wants to be criticized. Yet a lot of the HLTP work grew out of um, close examination of how other professionals were trained pilots, doctors, lawyers, counselors, um, clergy. And in all of those cases, a, a intense coaching was going on during performances. And yet teaching, as you pointed out, Nicole, uh, was never done that way. It's very performance oriented. You perform, um, in, and I'm talking about now like peer demonstrations, and you know, everybody applauds nicely and life goes on. And, um, and it's not, and so I think it, requires a great deal of trust within professional development and within teacher education that the coaching is intended to um, help teachers uh, engage in accomplished teaching. Um, and I think that this, this is a really important part is this of HLTPs is that because they're deconstructed, you can look analytically at these practices and, and look at the pedagogical moves that teachers make and, and, and say at certain points, you know, maybe you shouldn't have 
been doing asking that question at time? Or maybe there was a better question you could have asked at this point as you're discussing this text as one example. So I think this is really very, very important is that um, all fields, all professional development fields engage in in the moment coaching, as Eileen said. Um, in teaching, we just haven't really done that. As you said, it's a very siloed performance. It's very solitary. Um, teachers don't come to expect coaching within teaching. So I think this is a real difference and something I find very attractive about the HLTP movement. Absolutely. And I want to um, thank you both, um, Rick and Eileen, for the work that you've done in putting this book together and the service that it provides to the profession and for the time that you took to be with us today during this interview. It was a pleasure to have you and to hear directly from both of you exactly what it is that you're accomplishing and working towards accomplishing with this particular book. And uh, as we move forward, as I mentioned earlier in the introduction, we will have six more interviews, one for each of the high leverage teaching practices. So I hope that our listeners will continue to tune back in to really dig more deeply into each of these practices and then take that back into their work, not only for themselves, but with their professional communities that they work with.